All right, it is super exciting to be here. Uh, thank you, Paula, for a great talk. And uh, I'm really humbled to be uh, in the presence of the other uh, members of the Talented 12, uh, both in the past and in the future. This is a really special event. So thank you, CNE News, for putting it on. Uh, so I'd like to talk uh, to you today about the work I'm doing in my lab and a little bit about how I got here. And when, when I found out about this award, I, it kind of got me thinking a lot about why am I here, right? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Some of those uh, more existential questions in life. Uh, and if you asked me when I was growing up about the last thing I would have said I wanted to be was a scientist. Uh, so I've always had very diverse interests. And I would say kind of bringing together those diverse interests and, and knowing that you know, those diverse interests can uh, really uh, be leveraged together uh, to, to, uh, for my uh, career uh, has really brought me to this point. So I grew up in South Dakota. If you don't know where South Dakota is, go to the middle of the country and then north. Uh, it's quite cold, uh, but it's a state also with pretty diverse interests. If you've heard of South Dakota or been to South Dakota, uh, you've probably heard of the western side of the state, uh, which has some really dramatic landscapes in terms of the Badland National Park. We have Mount Rushmore and we have a really beautiful Native American culture. But I grew up in the more corn growing side of the state. We actually like corn so much we built a palace for it which is at the top of the, uh, of the slide there, the Corn Palace. It has kind of your classic rolling fields of grain, and I grew up in Yankton, South Dakota, on the Missouri River. Uh, and in high school, again, I had these two really diverse interests and passions, uh, neither of which were scientific. Uh, but I, was from, um, I grew up uh, really loving sports, and I grew up a competitive soccer player, kind of playing around the country, which eventually led to me being recruited to the football team to be a kicker. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, through uh, my teammates, we ended up even winning the state championship my senior year. But I also had this kind of very different life in high school where I was really, really into theater. Uh, I loved performing on stage. I was in competitive one-act plays every year in high school. And even uh, once I graduated, I was in a touring theater, com theater company where we uh, brought uh, different musicals around the whole state. But the one thing I wasn't interested <laughs> in at the time was chemistry. I actually had the opportunity to take an AP chemistry class from a really great uh, uh, teacher in my high school, and I said, no, no, no. I have these other interests that are more important. Uh, so I went on to the University of South Dakota, uh, about 30 miles down the road, uh, a really good state school, and I continued uh, my pursuit as a student athlete, uh, where I ended up graduating as the all-time leading scorer at the University of South Dakota uh, as a kicker. And I think thinking about kind of how those experiences shape me now, uh, Playing football at that level taught me two really important lessons that I take with me every day. Uh, one of which is accountability. It was very clear when I missed a kick. I was the only one that had uh, the ability to do that. Uh, but taking accountability for that, right, understanding that mistakes happen in life, uh, and being able to move forward from them productively was really important. Uh, and the second thing was uh, to not fear failure. So I had to be ready as a kicker to go out and miss a game-winning field goal uh, before I could ever have the confidence to make one, right? And I think, I think that influences uh, the problems my lab pursues today because, you know, we don't, we don't try to uh, shoot lower uh, because it's a safer problem, right? We want to really uh, not fear failure and go after those big challenges. Uh, and while playing football in, in um, college, I also uh, got my creative pursuit uh, really through research. So this is when I discovered uh, how, how much joy you can have in research, how I can get that creative outlet that I had in theater within research. And I really owe my career to the NSF Research Experience uh, for Undergraduates program, uh, where I got to get out of South Dakota uh, for one of the first times and move to the middle of Manhattan to Columbia University and participate in an REU there, uh, and then in the next summer at IBM. Uh, and I continued on this diverse interest as I moved into my research career and have had really great mentors along the way, including in, undergrad, in my undergraduate time with Jim Hedrick, a polymer scientist, and Colin Knuckles, who did or organic chemistry, uh, to my really fabulous mentor, who I owe a lot to, Craig Hawker at University of California, Santa Barbara, a polymer chemist. And I actually had the opportunity also uh, to work with a professor, Bong Jin Moon, from Sogong University in Korea, uh, who was on sabbatical in Craig's group there. And he was a really uh, talented, classically trained organic chemist. And if you look closely in that picture, there's another talented 12 alumni, Luis Campos, uh, who uh, joined me uh, in a trip to Korea. Uh, and then in a really uh, infor um, influential postdoc at MIT, uh, working in the lab of Tim, J Tim Jameson, but then getting to collaborate with Jeremiah Johnson at the beginning of his career. And it's these diverse interests 
that now, you know, as opposed to when I was younger, I kind of tried to keep those parts of my life separate. Now I'm trying to embrace the diverse interests I have uh, in leading this research group. Uh, and I wanted to put their pictures up front because this is a super talented, super enthusiastic group of people. Uh, we try to maintain a really uh, positive uh, lab culture, as Paula said, uh, and this makes going to work every day super, super fun. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the research we're pursuing. Uh, so we work in the area of synthetic polymers, what many of you may know better as plastics. So plastics have had a positive impact on almost every aspect of the modern world. Uh, most of our cars and airplanes are made of plastic, which makes, them orders, which makes them tremendously lighter, saving orders of magnitude of fuel in the process. Plastic packaging and food keeps produce fresher, longer, allowing us to feed more people in the same amount of arable land. And polymers are really important aspects of biomedical devices. There are over 12 uh, polymer drug conjugates in the clinic today, uh, and they're really key pieces of orthopedic medical devices. However, despite all the advantages of plastics, uh, they certainly have some disadvantages. The majority of plastics are currently made from petrochemical resources, uh, and their disposal, or lack thereof, uh, is currently choking our environment and our oceans. But this challenge stands in direct contrast to the fact that a lot of the future uh, needs we have in our society remain material limited. If we want really expansive solar energy, uh, that is built on flexible substrates and is easy to install and, and access, or if we want to create the next battery technology that then will store all that energy, we need continued innovations in synthetic materials. The same can be said if we want to right, grow an organ in a lab uh, or a tissue, we need to recapitulate the complexities of the extracellular matrix in a synthetic material. So as we move forward with material design, uh, we really only have one choice. The materials have to be both sustainable and functional. We can't have this either-or approach to material design anymore. So it's clear that the materials of today will not solve tomorrow's challenges. Uh, and as somebody who's interested in organic synthesis, right, this might be a bit, bit biased, but I contend that the way we make materials today will not be the way to solve tomorrow's challenges. So we need to really uh, develop fundamental innovations in how we make these polymers in order to move towards an, uh, a, a time where we're making both sustainable and functional materials. And I contend, and I will tell you about how I think polymer stereochemistry will play a large role in that. So to think about the influence of stereochemistry in polymers, I ask you to consider the difference between cellulose and starch. Cellulose is a, a structural material in plants that we use for paper and cotton. Starch. Uh, is an important part of our diet found in the grains and potatoes. However, both these biopolymers are chemically identical polymers of glucose. They differ only in one stereocenter per repeat unit, and that gives them these drastically different material properties. So the same can be said of synthetic polymers, and this was really pointed out by Julio Nada in 1955 when he discovered how to control the stereochemistry of polypropylene. So atactic polypropylene, where you don't control the stereochemistry, is an effectively useless viscous liquid. However, isotactic polypropylene, when all you do is you take that same material and control the stereochemistry, this is the second most important polymer in the world, made at over 50 million tons annually, used in everything from high-strength fibers to packaging to the mumper of your car. Uh, so this is the dramatic difference that stereochemistry can have in polymers. So why don't we take sustainable materials and you know, use the methods that are used for polypropylene to control their stereochemistry? Well, there's a fundamental limitation. So we control the stereochemistry of polypropylene and other uh, alpha olefins by coordination insertion polymerization. And the key here is that as you're growing this long polymer chain, the end group is always attached to a metal center. Thus, you can control ligand geometry around that metal center. That will control facial addition of the next monomers and stereochemistry. However, if you add even a small amount of any polar or more functional group, uh, such as this Lewis basic heteroatom, that will irreversibly bind to these early transition metal catalysts, and you'll get no polymer out. So this has been the fundamental limitation for over 60 years that have, has impeded progress. And what this means really is coordination insertion polymerization is kind of a, a synthetic method made for petrochemical resources. 
right? If we want to move to incorporating building blocks from things like corn, mint, and trees, right, biology loves to oxidize things. So we have lots of these uh, Lewis basic heteroatoms that we need to create methods uh, to be able to access. So because coordination insertion polymerization only works uh, for these hydrophobic monomers, we usually polymerize more functional materials. I show here a vinyl ether through ionic polymerization. In ionic polymerization, you don't have a metal bound to the chain end. You have this achiral reactive intermediate where the next monomer uh, can um, attack on either face of this intermediate, giving you atactic polymers. So our central hypothesis uh, when I started uh, my group was if you, right, we can't bind a metal center to this chain end, but what if we can take advantage of this counter ion? And by, by creating a chiral counter ion, can we control the stereochemical environment at the end group of that polymer and thus bias facial addition of each incoming monomer? And again, uh, my diverse interest uh, and the skill set I gained during my PhD and postdoc really helped with this because I was able to look uh, at the tools of small molecule organic chemistry and asymmetric ion pairing catalysis uh, and, and see these binyl derived phosphoric acids as a really privileged scaffold to be able to leverage this type of idea. Uh, and if you look back at this literature, you actually see building blocks that we'd like to make polymers from reported to undergo highly stereoselective reactions. So I won't give you kind of all the gory details, but uh, in summary, we were able to uh, demonstrate this concept with one chiral counter ion. I show here the polymerization of vinyl ethers to isotactic polyvinyl ethers with 88 to 93 percent stereoselectivity depending on that R group. And for each of these, this is the highest stereoselectivity reported to date. And imparting stereochemistry gave us the emergent physical properties that we were looking for. So what's shown on your left is typical polyvinyl ethers that are atactic where you don't control the stereochemistry. And what's shown on the right is the use of our chiral anion to control the stereochemistry it gives you these really nice semi-crystalline thermoplastics. And I really like this picture because those two materials are chemically identical polymers. They're simply stereoisomers of each other. And you can see the emergent physical properties that provides. And to kind of quantitate those physical properties, what we could do is we could take that material, we could press it into a film, and we could pull on it till it breaks and see what kind of response we get. Uh, and what I show you here is the black dotted line there is actually a polyethylene material we bought from Dow Chemical. So that's a commercial polymer made at really large scale. And our materials has effectively the same exact mechanical properties as that commercial material. But the nice thing, because we're able to now impart functionality into our polymer uh, by controlling stereochemistry via this ionic polymerization, our material actually has adhesion properties to glass and other polar materials that are 14 times better than that Dow commercial polyethylene. So by using this chiral counter ion approach, we're able to make materials that you might recognize but actually have emergent properties such as adhesion. Also, I told you quickly about you know, how we developed this method to create novel materials and are able to do structural property studies. And I would say in many ways, this is kind of the, the uh, uh, way in which my group works. Uh, so moving forward, right, we don't want to kind of stop at vinyl ethers. We want to see if this conceptual approach could be applicable to multiple classes of polymers and really make this a platform method. So one of the first things we're doing with vinyl ethers is can we expand the substrate scope? Uh, and again, now that we can use uh, much more uh, functional monomers, can uh, those building blocks actually be made from biorenewable resources? Again, things we get from sugar or fermentation or trees. Uh, and can incorporating functional handles uh, into this polymer actually give you sites to kind of do a retrosynthetic depolymerization of these materials. So not only are we making them from renew renewable resources, but then we can actually break them down and repolymerize uh, some of these uh, materials to move towards a more sustainable plastics economy. Uh, and I think this will work beyond vinyl ethers also. So again, this larger scale conceptual approach uh, can hopefully develop emergent properties from a whole variety of building blocks uh, that we've kind of uh, thought you know, did a certain uh, function uh, without stereo control. Uh, and of course, the overall goal is really to make an impact here, right? The polymer industry is absolutely massive. And if we can shift more and more of that industry towards sustainable materials, uh, as you can see, it's a pretty small slice there, uh, I think we can have an impact. And I think stereo control will actually give these sustainable polymers the property, the properties that you know, consumers want to use. And I think that'll be the first step 
uh, in bringing that to life.